Good morning, my name is Lise Grande and I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace, which was established by the US Congress in 1984 as a national public institution committed to helping prevent, mitigate and resolve violent conflict abroad. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to our panelists and to everyone who is able to join us today. What we hope to do in today's discussion is to explore an aspect of decarbonization and the transition to green economies that is looked at, but we would argue is not looked at enough. And that is the potential for conflict that is tied to that transition. As I think all of us know, the invasion of Russia, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine has raised many questions about the impact on energy markets, because of actions that are take, taken by aggressor countries. We also know that in a number of countries that are oil producers, there are complex political arrangements and compacts that are in place that are certainly going to be impacted by the transition, either into new forms of green economy or because of decarbonization itself. What we hope to do in today's meeting is to explore the many aspects of that crucial question. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Tegan Blaine, who is the head of the Institute's Environment, Conflict, and Climate Program. Tegan. Thank you so much, Lise, for opening our event today. And allow me to echo your welcome to everyone joining today's expert panel. We look forward to exploring together the topic of today's seminar, how decarbonization will affect peace processes and political settlements in fragile oil producing states, but also why the learnings from this work are relevant both to the peace building field and the climate change community working on a just transition to a global green economy. I do want to say a couple of words first about where this program comes from. The U.S. Institute of Peace's grants program supports the research we will discuss today. Since its establishment in 1986, USIP's grant making has sought to seed and develop the international conflict resolution and peacebuilding field. Over the years, USIP has awarded some 2,300 grants to organizations and institutions in 46 states, the District of Columbia, and 90 countries. US, USIP grants have increased the breadth, depth, and reach of the Institute's work, and they have, over the years, leveraged millions of dollars in funding from other donors. This program has been a longtime supporter of projects focusing on the nexus of climate and conflict, having funded peace builders to work on research, dialogue, and capacity building initiatives related to the environment since the early 1990s. Recognizing the growing importance that the environment plays in conflict zones where we work, USIP ran its first competition solely, uh, excuse me, solely dedicated to environment conflict and peace building in 2020, funding research that touches on nearly two dozen countries across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. The projects include studying the, the effects of climate-induced displacement in Nigeria, supporting grassroots environmental peacebuilding movements in northern Kenya, developing tools to more effectively monitor, evaluate, and learn from environmental peacebuilding efforts, just to name a few. The panelists here today from Tufts University and the World Peace Foundation were able to conduct this research as USIP grantees. I'd also like to extend a special word of recognition to my colleague, Jeremy Moore, for leading this grants program and overseeing many of these projects. This seminar also fits into USIP's program on climate, environment, and conflict, which was launched in 2021. The program focuses on three main thematic areas, migration and displacement related to climate and environmental change, transboundary waters in a changing climate, and a just transition to a global green economy. While the research being discussed today has important conclusions around peace processes and political settlements in fragile oil producing countries, it also raises questions about how we support a peaceful transition away from fossil fuels in countries that have been highly dependent on their revenue. This is a topic I hope we can delve into more during the question and answer period and really get a good conversation going with many of you as participants. Now. With that background complete, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. <laughs> 
Alex DeWall is the executive director of the World Peace Foundation at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where he is also a research professor. His academic work has probed humanitarian crisis and response, human rights, HIV and AIDS, and governance in Africa and conflict and peace building. His latest book is Mass Starvation, The History and Future of Famine, and he's also the author of The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa. He's worked in very practical ways on peace building. He was seconded to the African Union mediation team for Darfur from 20 or 2005 to 2006, and also served as a senior advisor to the African Union's high-level implementation panel for Sudan from 2009 to 2011, where he took on several roles in the negotiations leading to the independence of South Sudan. Our second speaker, Aditya Sarkar, is a USD or is a PhD researcher affiliated with the Fletcher School at Tufts, where his dissertation work focuses on the changing politics of claim making by newly urbanizing populations in small towns in India, with a broad interest in issues of informal work, migration, and urbanization. He is also part of the Peace and Conflict Resolution Evidence Platform, which is a seven-year research consortium led by the University of Edinburgh's Law School. Besides being a trained lawyer himself, Aditya has worked as an independent researcher with organizations such as the World Bank, the International Labor Organization, and the Open Society Foundations. Lastly, I'd like to recognize the contributions of a third main researcher on this project, although he couldn't be here today, Benjamin Spatz. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town's Graduate School of Business, but he's currently on leave to serve in the U.S. government as a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. So we have him just down the road from us, even if he isn't able to participate in today's seminar. So that's a little bit about our speakers. Now, I'd like to begin the discussion today by asking both of our speakers a quick question to get us started. Alex, first off, what is the origin of this work and what led to your interest in decarbonization and political settlements? Well, first of all, it's really a, a pleasure to be with you. And, and, and the World Peace Foundation has a quite well-established partnership with USIP. Our history goes back even further. We go, we go back to 1910 when we were, we were founded. Um, and, 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 and we're really a pr of the, in the, the, the common shared interests and, and, and collaborations that we, that, that, that we've managed to accomplish over the years. Um, getting to your question, the specific thing that stimulated our interest of this was in my previous job before I joined the World Peace Foundation, when I was working with the African Union as a practitioner and in the mediation leading up to the independence of South Sudan in, in 2011, which is a, a topic, a country very close to the heart of your president and CEO, Lise Grande. Um, two things were very remarkable at that time. One was that with the separation of South Sudan, Sudan, the broader Sudan, the northern Sudan, lost 75% of its um, oil and almost all its uh, foreign exchange earnings uh, because of, of, of the secession of the, the oil-rich South. And I was part of the team that engaged with the, the, the Sudanese technocrats, the Minister of Finance, the, the central bank, about how they would manage this transition. And they had a number of ideas, but their political leadership just didn't have a clue. And then within a year of the independence of South Sudan, the, the South Sudanese shut off their oil production completely, which was a contributor to the civil war that broke out a year later. And so it struck me that this was going to be a much, much bigger issue across oil producing fragile states in Africa and elsewhere um, with the impending transition to a, a carbon free economy. And we coined this phrase traumatic decarbonization. Thank you so much, Alex, for a little bit of that background. Aditya, I think Alex has primed you perfectly to explain what traumatic decarbonization means. Help us understand that term. Absolutely. And um, thanks again. I want to echo Alex in saying it's a, that it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having us and for letting us share some of the findings from our research. Um, now, what is traumatic decarbonization? 
course, to explain that, we should uh, look at the expression decarbonization, which usually refers to the replacement of fossil fuels with cleaner or non-hydrocarbon based forms of energy, and such as renewable energy. And this is obviously critically important for mitigating the worst impacts of climate change and for transitioning to a low carbon economy. Now, as the world decarbonizes, we would expect the demand for fossil fuels to decline over the medium term notwithstanding periodic spices, uh, spikes in uh, oil prices, such as the one caused by the war in Ukraine. Now, decarbonization will also mean declining oil revenues for oil-producing states. And this is important, and, and Lise uh, referred to this in her opening remarks. This is important because in many countries, oil and gas revenues play a key role in politics. So some of these oil-producing countries are relatively well-prepared for the energy transition. Others are not. And some of the countries which are especially ill-prepared for the transition are those that we commonly call fragile, countries which have weak institutions and are often violent. So in, in places such as South Sudan, Venezuela, Iraq, Nigeria, political leaders, for almost all men, rely on oil revenues to control government and state, to buy elections, to assemble political coalitions, control armies and militias, and to extend patronage to their allies. So in these countries, leaders and political elites are really focused on short-term survival and on retaining power. And oil revenues are a critical component of these survival strategies. So the focus of our research, therefore, was, was traumatic decarbonization, which we use to refer to the sudden unplanned reduction of oil revenues in states, which are dependent on these oil revenues for their current political system. And they really began with the hypothesis that this type of decarbonization would have implications for stability, for violence, for peacemaking efforts, corruption, development outcomes, etc. And we tried to test it through six case studies and, and a couple of thematic papers. And the case studies really covered Sudan, South Sudan, Iraq, Nigeria, Ecuador, and Venezuela. And we had two thematic papers, one on sort of the energy transition more generally, and uh, a second one on, on the effects of oil prices on peacemaking. And I should just end by acknowledging the work of the fantastic researchers who did work on these papers, Shahla Al-Kli, uh, Katrina Burgess, Javier Corrales, Joshua Kreis, Karun Gopalakrishnan, uh, Jared Miller, Luke Beatty, and Jan Pospisil. And of course, Ben Spatz, Alex, and I were also involved. Let me stop there. Thanks so much, Aditya. I really appreciate you bringing up the authors of all of the case studies that this work relies on. I also noticed you slip in something about the gender of many of the individuals controlling oil, which probably won't be a major topic of this, this particular seminar, but raised a question in my own mind. Um, but anyway, I'll leave that for later. Now is our chance to delve into the research a little bit. And again, Alex, I'll start with you per first, if that's okay, and then move to Aditya. Alex, you've worked on politics in the marketplace for a long time, and I'm wondering whether you can help us understand how oil rents and decarbonization fit into this space. So let me explain where this framework of the political marketplace came from. And, I, and, and again, I'll, I'll put it in the context of my, my own experience as a practitioner and then move on to, to, to pick up on, on, on the issues that, that Aditya has raised. So the political marketplace framework began as an ethnographic observation, really, I, I, as, as somebody who was a member of mediation teams, first of all, in Darfur, then North and South Sudan. And in the Darfur talks back in 2005, 2006, the Sudanese chief negotiator, the representative of the National Congress Party in Khartoum, he didn't see his job really as getting a beautiful piece of paper with signatures on the bottom and fully committed to the sort of the, 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 the all the array of measures in um, that would be called for for addressing the root causes of the conflict in Darfur. Now, he saw himself very explicitly as a trader in a marketplace. He was using what he called his political budget, which were the money that he was given by his boss, President Omar al-Bashir, which he didn't have to account for piece by piece, to buy up individuals from the rebel camp and also keep in line his own allies, his own militia in Darfur, at the going rate, 
And the going rate went up and down depending on on a number of factors, supply and demand for for, for the services of, of, of rebels, whether the Chadians and the Libyans and indeed the Americans were in this market as well. Um, at that time, Darfur, he said, was deregulated gangsterism. He wanted it to be a monopoly in which he um, was the, the, the monopoly buyer purchaser of, of these political services. So the theory really is one in which mercenarized transactional politics, that is bribery and coercion, is how real politics works. And the bribery isn't so much for personal enrichment, though that's an element. It's to allow the individual who is being bought himself, and they are almost all men, to bribe his own underlings to keep himself as a viable political business, a political concern. Um, so political budget, political market. And this is how provincial governance in Sudan and a number of other countries has operated for decades. And when South Sudan got its independence, it liberated itself from northern Sudan, but it continued basically the same practice of, 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 of real politics. Now, the link to the carbon economy is, 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 is very important because Sudan became an oil exporter some 20, 22 years ago. And the oil revenues were channeled into political budgets from the state at the top, through, either directly through discretionary funds or they were they were recycled through construction contracts and so on, which had which were massively over invoiced and and, and 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 the money then went into the party or the security budget. And it was oil revenues that made possible the comprehensive peace agreement of 2005 that ended that civil war. It brought the the rebels, the former rebels, the SPLA, SPLM into government. The um, the SPLA traded its insurgency for a share of the money. And according to the, the, the comparative um, studies that we have, um, that we did, this seems to be a common feature. We can come back perhaps to the patterns of oil revenues and, and, and the types of conflicts and the types of peace that we see. But what we saw in the aftermath of the decarbonization um, in, in the north because it lost its oil revenues in the south and the south because it shut down its oil revenues was very interesting. The In the north, economic planners wanted to restructure the economy and shift to agriculture. But that wasn't actually what happened. What happened was that they the, the politicians replaced oil revenues with revenue from gold. And gold is very different because gold is mined artisanally in small mines in the peripheries. And therefore the control over that revenue belonged to the militia that controlled the places and, 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 and controlled the mines and also controlled the smuggling. And the leaders of that of, 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 of those militia, who are former Janjaweed, the notorious Darfur militia, um, were transformed into a group called the Rapid Support Forces, headed by a commander called um, uh, Mohammed Hemeti, became extremely powerful and indeed um, as powerful as the regular armed forces. And as the government in the center lost its revenues and lost its capability of keeping that that political coalition at the center in power and was forced into inflationary financing in order to, to, to carry on paying for its, its, its political spending and also to, to buy the gold. Um, the, the citizens of, of, of Khartoum and, and the central areas rose up in revolt. And there were, as it were, two revolutions going on at the same time. The ordinary people demanding an end to this autocratic kleptocracy and the, these militia forces empowered by the shift from oil to gold demanding power too. So we saw a major change in, in, in northern Sudan. And perhaps we could see similar scenarios elsewhere. This was one of our hypotheses, which Aditya will address. Now, South Sudan was even more dependent on oil revenue than the north. Something like 95, 96% of its government revenue came from oil. And when it cut its oil uh, production to zero, in, in, in 2012, it expected this to be brief. It didn't, it was not a long-term 
It was not planning for this to be a, a long-term decarbonization, but it pretty much turned out that way. It has not managed to restore its production since. But And in the short term, it ran out of money, not just for, 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 for making the government function, but also for, for these political payments, for the payments to the army in particular, which was a sort of coalition of different militia. So our first hypothesis was that this financial crunch caused the outbreak of South Sudan's civil war in December 2013. And our researcher, Josh Craze, investigated this, and he found that there was an element of truth in this, but the reality actually was more complicated and more interesting, in that the, 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 the government of President Salva Kiir actually then went back to long-standing patterns of extraction and coercion and predation, um, abandoning his what, what he had hitherto had, which was a big tent policy of using oil revenues to buy all these different rivalrous political factions into a government. So we saw a, a general disintegration of the, um, the, the cohesion of the government and, 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 and that strategy and its replacement with um, a different and, and, and sadly rather more um, authoritarian, um, autocratic pattern of governance. And again, we um, this this poses a pattern and, 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 and a set of hypotheses about the links between decarbonization and conflict, which we begin to see in in for in different forms elsewhere. Thank you so much. I I don't think in spite of the fact that I've read your work that I had really fully understand some of or fully understood some of these trends and how gold is so different than oil in terms of where it confers power and what that meant for kind of a, an on ongoing set of events. Um Aditya, tell us a little bit about what decarbonization changes about this story and what doesn't change. Can you give us a bit more detail there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and thanks, Alex, for sort of, again, teeing up uh, my points quite nicely. Um, so I'm going to try and make four brief points and I'll each of these further in the Q&A. But the first point is about the patterns of peacemaking and how they are associated with high and low oil prices. Um, so our researcher Jan Pospisil uh, worked on using peace agreements data and oil price data to try and understand whether there were correlations between oil prices and patterns of peacemaking since the 1990s. And he found about 54 peace processes since the 1990s, which were associated with conflicts in oil producing countries. Now that number is obviously too low for a credible statistical assessment, but, but he did have one key descriptive finding, which is, which is useful in the flag though, which is that periods of declining oil revenue are surprisingly associated with more peace agreements and periods of increasing oil revenue are actually associated with fewer peace agreements. Now, that seems to fly in the face of our hypothesis. But that, that this quandary seems to be resolved if you look at the difference between the types of peace agreements which are signed at this time. Now, when there's higher oil prices, greater availability of oil money, what you see are fewer peace agreements, but those peace agreements tend to be comprehensive, that they deal with a wide gamut of political issues. On the other hand, when you have lower oil prices, lower oil revenue, you see more ceasefires and many more ceasefires. So you have short-term limited agreements uh, instead of these larger all-encompassing peace agreements. Now, this suggests that increased oil revenues allow for what Alex just called big tent patronage politics, where almost all elites and contending groups can share in the revenue to some extent. On the other hand, lower oil revenues seem to be associated with greater bargaining and negotiation between elites, often violently, and greater conflict and shorter term peacemaking efforts in the form of ceasefires. Now, the second point which I want to make is that the rules of politics tend to stay the same after decarbonization. 
even though the relative balance of power between different elites and different elite groups might actually change. Now, I'm going to divide this point into three sub-points. The first is that when decarbonization causes rapid shortfalls in revenue, politicians look for alternate sources of revenue. They also make calculations about who needs to be paid off immediately, whose claims can actually be postponed for some time, and which claims can either be denied completely or can be violently suppressed. Now, some of the common tactics that they use in, to look for alternate uh, sources of revenue or to increase availability of existing revenue is um, cutting spending on public goods and services, mortgaging future oil production for cash in hand, often at a large discount, turning to other forms of resource extraction. Alex just spoke about gold, but timber is, is another obvious example. Um, they also indulge in rent seeking through activities such as trafficking of narcotics, smuggling, extortion and protection rackets. Uh, you also see simply uh, simple preying on populations through loot and plunder and land seizures, sometimes directly and sometimes by licensing of subordinate political players. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, take the case of Nigeria, where oil rents provide about 65 to 85 percent of overall government revenue. And oil rents are a key element of Nigerian politics. So after prices for Nigerian crude dropped by about 75% in 2020, uh, the government secured international loans to fund about 20% of the gap in the federal budget. Then, and despite calls for austerity measures, what was cut were actually health and welfare programs, and this during a global pandemic, while budgets for zonal projects and state-owned enterprises actually increased. And these budgets for zonal projects and state-owned enterprises have historically been the way in which elites access and distribute patronage rents. Now, the second sub-point within this, this broader point is that there are key differences between temporary and permanent decarbonization. In cases where revenue shortfalls are caused by fluctuations in global oil prices, politicians may seek short-term sources of finance, such as loans, as in the case of Nigeria. Uh, also uh, something we saw in the Iraq case. In other cases where the decline in oil revenue seems to be a longer-term trend, there tends to be a more fundamental reorientation of the political economy. And the Venezuelan case is an excellent, excellent one for this. When there, the decline of oil rents was actually caused by mismanagement and underinvestment and predated the global drop in, in oil prices. Nonetheless, when oil prices fell in 2014-16, it compounded an existing macroeconomic crisis. And the Venezuelan president responded by resorting, of course, to repression, but also by expanding the role of the military in economic activity, especially mining. So the Orinoco mining arc, which is a mining zone rich in gold, copper, and iron, among other minerals, was opened up for strategic development, and the military was given special powers to manage the zone. Illegal mining sites mushroomed, drug trafficking flourished, and revenues from both were channeled to ruling elites. So in effect, the regime turned to this complex web of extraction, transportation, and bribery involving artisanal miners, gangs, and guerrillas, members of the military, as well as high-ranking government officials to generate revenue. Now, the third sub-point within the, this point is that as a result of these strategies, Alliances tend to shift and there are clear winners and losers. But the rules of politics don't change. Rarely do you see a move away from transactional politics to more institutionalized political systems. Now, to, to go back to the, the main points I was making, the third point I want to make is that decarbonization in almost all our cases was associated with the immiseration of the population. Now, what I mean by this is that decarbonization is usually the catalyst. It is not the sole cause of economic distress. But in all our cases, the decline in oil rents caused budgetary shortfalls and precipitated macroeconomic crisis. In these countries, which we were looking at, and even at their most benign, elites had little incentive to provide public goods or undertake welfare-enhancing economic reforms. And again, uh, of our cases, maybe Ecuador and perhaps to an extent, Venezuela somewhat different. But, but the general uh, rule holds true. 
So in general, and even before decarbonization, the overarching political economy in many of these countries was already heavily skewed against most of the population. After decarbonization, and in every case other than Ecuador, governments either ignored the crisis or exacerbated it through their efforts to find alternate sources of revenue and rent, and through the often violent methods that they used to extract that rent. Um, maybe I'll, in the interests of time, I'm going to skip over this, skip over giving an example, and I'll come back to this in the Q&A if that's, if that's of interest. Um, and I'll come to my final point, which is about off-ramps. I mean, do the cases that we studied, they tell us anything for, about how decarbonization can be associated with moving away from transactional politics? And I think the evidence for that is, is somewhat mixed. Um, in most of our cases, there was some form of large-scale nonviolent protests during or after decarbonization. And the protests followed a fairly well-established uh, pattern. They were sparked by material issues, usually price of bread, unemployment, lack of electricity, especially in Iraq during the summer months. And then they expanded to demand broader systemic change. But they didn't always result in substantive change. So Iraq is, is an excellent example. I mean, Iraq's historic levels of protest in October 2019 uh, against corruption, economic decline, and endless cycles of conflict actually ended in repression and elite retrenchment. The elite actually sort of strengthened their grip on power. Uh, in some cases, security forces opened fire on protesters, killing and wounding people. But political parties and militia also carried out targeted assassinations, detention, torture, and intimidation of civil society and, and activists. And this was carried out with impunity. And as a result, the sort of protests were, uh, were, were curtailed pretty, pretty rapidly. Sudan is, is, a, is a similar case, and, and Alex touched on this, because there the military has been able to strengthen its grip on power over the, the few couple of years after the revolution. And this despite widespread and continued courageous civilian uh, protests. The only counterexample that we actually found was in, was in Ecuador, where mass political agitation, especially by indigenous groups, labor organizations, and anti-tax demonstrators, did play a significant role in fueling a split within the ruling party, and subsequently in ensuring that President Rafael Correa did not seek re-election in 2017. But, Ecuadorian, but the Ecuadorian political system is also something which is a little bit more institutionalized than many of the other cases that we saw. And the military plays a, a more limited role in politics. So the extent to which we can sort of extend these findings from, from Ecuador to other cases is, is an open question. That said, what we do know is that mass, widespread, nonviolent protests seem to be the only way in which the needle can, can shift at all. So let me stop there. And again, as I said, happy to come back to any of these in the Q&A. Thanks. Many, many really important points there, Aditya, and I do hope that we will get into some of these issues a little bit more in depth in the in the discussion. Um, for everybody who's online, please feel free to begin submitting questions through the question box on the screen in front of you. I will be passing those on to the speakers, and so start writing down anything that you'd like to discuss. I'm at least going to throw out one question to get us started, which is near and dear to my heart, and that's about climate change. Um, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change actively dis encourages decarbonization. And as we move towards a global green economy that will help limit climate change, decarbon we're probably going to be under increased pressure to see decarbonization around the world. Depending on how rapidly this transition takes place, it is probably going to result in significant changes in oil and gas, gas prices and sales. And yet, I don't think that the climate change community has really wrestled yet with what these ch changes actually mean for politics and stability in fragile and oil-producing countries as well as the implications for their neighbors. And Aditya in particular, you're talking about some of the social and economic ramifications for some of the, the people who are least able to cope with these kinds of changes too. But I guess my question really is, 
what do you think that the climate change community should really take away from your work to guide international action around the transition to a global green economy? Perhaps, Alex, I'll start with you, but Aditya, if you want to add to it as well, I'd appreciate both of your thoughts. Thank you. That's a that's a, a big and challenging question. And let me start with a, a sort of a general response. Uh, and then and then a couple of specific points. The general one is we all want to see this 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 global energy transition. Um or all of us in this community want to see it. But this green energy uh, uh, climate crisis response community has been fighting an epochal battle in the global policy sphere to get the world's most senior policymakers to acknowledge the evidence, accept the analysis, and put in place global institutions and international economic incentives to make it possible to decarbonize. And that is uh, uh, that has been a monumental struggle. What I'm, I'm afraid a rather depressing message from this is you can succeed in that struggle, but there's another battle. There's another arena in which um, the, the struggle needs to be continued and one in which we are rather ill-prepared to fight. And this is the arena of transactional or, quotes, real politics. So for the transactional politician, um, the player in the house of cards, if you like, none of these policies and institutions really matter. Or to be more precise, they matter only insofar as they provide assets, opportunities or obstacles to them to continue playing their game. They're not really interested in those public goods. And, and, and they may actually, ironically, have entered politics with an interest in public goods, but the rules of the political market in these countries mean that if you cannot compete with others who are more ruthless, more cynical players who are interested only in power, you are simply not going to survive. So we need to understand how this arena of, of real politics operates, its, its incentives, its mechanisms. And, and I think the political marketplace framework is, is, is actually a, a pretty good framework for getting to grips with, with what is happening. Um, so I think the, 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 the general point is, is, is we need to sit together, those of us who, 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 who work in this, studying this, um, this rather um, disagreeable set of political realities and practices, people who study um, uh, corruption and violence and so on, with the, the, the climate change folks and, 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 and see how we um, build those alliances and common approaches. And let me highlight two, two issues that, uh, specific issues that come up. One that actually um, Aditya alluded to, which is that um, under the pressure of loss of carbon revenues, a ruling elite in a government may turn to an alternative resource such as timber. So um, we might see actually something even worse, which is, for example, massive deforestation for timber or for turning um, uh, tropical forests, wetlands into um, to intensive agriculture, um, which just in order to um, to fulfill those short-term uh, political budgetary needs. And I think we need to pay attention to that and how to align the incentives. The other is, is looking at the peacemaking community, because what we, um, building on the points that Aditya was making about the, the, the way in which what we see is um, when uh, oil prices are high, we see more comprehensive agreements. When oil prices are low, we see sort of scattered ceasefires and, 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 and small bargains being made. Um, what does it mean to try and, and, and make peace in countries where that central authority that is ha ha has a major source of revenue that it is using for this big tent politics, when it can't do those big tent politics, when we get 
a shift, if you like, to a, a more Hobbesian state of, of a war of all against all. And we're terribly bad at actually um, designing and implementing peace processes in in this kind of environment it's something that we um that we urgently need to 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 um bring our our, our focus our energy our analysis to those are really a couple of really good points, Alex. Number one, about where countries will move to in terms of, of recovering the lost oil revenues and the risks from a climate perspective, but also this question about what this means about how we work on peace processes and the really significant risks there as we see political systems move in different directions. Aditya, would you like to add anything to the question about what the climate change community should learn from your work? Um, I suppose it's a fairly commonplace and, and fairly self-evident observation, which is to extend Alex's point that climate change, uh, the, the community that is working actively on climate change needs to look beyond sort of the specific contours of the transition itself to assess the implications of decarbonization. And I think that is, is quite, a, quite a key point. Uh, and the second point, which is around time horizons, because I think one of the time, one of the things that uh, climate change, the climate change community is working with is a sort of short to medium term in the sense that these changes are urgent, they need to happen immediately. But obviously, they will take a medium term sort of period of time to play out. Whereas many of the political leaders that we are talking about uh, are only focused on the day to day survival. And this creates a sort of disjunct, if you will, between, between the time scales that the different groups are working with. And I think that, and I'm not sure that there's an obvious way of responding to that, but being aware of it is. is is important in and of itself. And I think that's those are my points. Yeah, very much so. You know, there was another question that, or a question that had come in just as we were beginning this conversation, specifically about the role that. Uh, or how we think about the next Conference of Parties president for the UN negotiations on climate change being Sultan al-Jabbar, and I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing his name correctly, so apologies. And, you know, what that actually means for how we address these kinds of issues in the short term, and then also how this fits into strategic competition around this transition to green technologies. Is this a question that either of you feel able to take on in terms of the the current politics around the climate change negotiations and kind of how we address these issues at COP when we're also dealing with controversies around COP leadership? Um, let me make some points that are a little, perhaps a little bit oblique to the the, the, the central question of, 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 of about the, the the venue of 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 the forthcoming COP in 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 the Gulf, which are to do with the the role of the the Gulf states foreign policies um, in the uh, particularly in, in 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 the more adjacent areas of developing countries, which in the area I'm familiar with is 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 the Horn, but also more more widely. And there are two elements to this that that I think need to be that, that are very relevant to this discussion. The first is that the um, the the Gulf monarchies obviously are. You know, highly reliant on on carbon rents, but they are in a position where they can go through planned non-traumatic decarbonization. They have the money to look ahead. Part of their strategy for doing that is diversification, and particularly diversification of investments on issues to do with food security, because they are obviously food importers and, 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 and they want to secure the food supply chains. 
And this involves um, major investments in land and agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and elsewhere. And there are major issues that arise about the um, social equity, uh, sustainable development, but also the car developments. Um, so they may be uh, they may be going through a process of planned decarbonization that is um, certainly meeting their needs and, and, and meeting the broader needs of, of the shift out of a, of, of, of a carbon economy. But they may be shifting the burden, some of the burdens to, to, um, to countries that are, that are less able to cope. And the other element to this is if we, if, if we take the model of the political market and, and monetize transactional politics, the foreign and security policies of the Gulf monarchies are the apogee of this. This is how they conduct their business across the greater Middle East and, and, and across Africa. They give massive cash handouts for the political alignment and loyalties of, of um, elites across the Middle East, um, Central Asia, and 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 Africa, um, they are. Let, let me be candid. Profoundly corrupt and corrupting. And if we want to see um, the 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 decarbonization of fragile oil producers, resulting in a lessening of corruption, a lessening of transactional politics, we need these rulers to change their business model quite radically. The point that you make about how, you know, the oil revenues have been a resource for diplomatic actions is a really interesting one. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, Aditya, anything I, to add? Yeah, I was going to sort of uh, jump in and just, just say something about Again, a point that's oblique, it's not directly addressing the question about strategic competition around green uh, technologies. But I think it's useful to step back and think about the role that oil plays in very different, uh, very different political systems. And I think we can sort of broadly uh, think of three categories. And obviously there's overlap and, and, and countries move between categories. But we can think of states as being, as oil producing states as being those which are stable with diversified economies. So you have, for example, United States, Canada, Norway, United Kingdom, et cetera, as falling into that category. I mean, it's, that is probably where Colombia, Indonesia, Mexico, Brazil might also, also fit, even if that fit is not quite as, as perfect. You can think of places where there's a political settlement which is based entirely on, on carbon. Uh, sometimes authoritarian, and, and the state-society compact is based on channeling oil revenues to the population in the form of economic benefits. So, I mean, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, and in the past, perhaps Iraq, Libya, and Venezuela might have also fallen into this category. And the final is one, for the lack of a better expression, which we are calling carbon-related political unsettlements. I mean, where hydrocarbon reserves are being exploited in an institutionally fragmented political system. So it's not that it is the exploitation which is tra triggering conflict, but it does shape the landscape of conflict. And I think in thinking about these questions, for example, strategic competition, etc., uh, green technologies, it's worthwhile thinking about which level of country that question falls into. And uh, again, obviously, as I said, there are overlaps and it's not a perfect classification by any means. But um, yeah, just to say that. Over. Now, your final point about which level of country we're talking about and how, how fragile those countries are or how stable those countries are and their resilience within those various political systems to absorb changes is really critical. We have a question that might turn us in a slightly different direction. Um, and this is about some of the toxic legacies of the oil, of oil production in many countries. International oil companies' divestments are accelerating in Nigeria without steps to address some of these toxic legacies, such as pollution, division, et cetera. 
Do you have any suggestions of international policy interventions to learn from? And if not, what should this divestment look like? Hmm. That's a fascinating question and really not, um, not one that we have really reflected upon. Um, I, I did you, I, am I wrong? Have you, perhaps you have something to add, but I'm, I, I would, I think that there's a, there's, there's an interesting agenda here, which is of course, decarbonization means that oil companies are not going to be making money. Um, so who, um, of course they have accrued enormous gigantic profits over over the years uh, but who who should be liable for this uh uh cleaning up the mess and is is this something that comes within the loss under the loss and damage heading that has been raised as as uh, as as a an agenda item at the last well previous cops but at least some 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 progress was made recently um i don't have an answer to that but i think it's it, it's it's an agenda item to 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 be pursued aditya any thoughts i know this um, is a hard one given where your research has focused yeah, no, I think Alex has summed it up quite quite nicely. I think it's also worth thinking about, I, I mean, and just to sort of tack on to it without answering the question, uh, really, because I don't have a clear answer, uh, is to say that the divestment of Western oil companies doesn't necessarily mean that oil production is going down. It doesn't also mean that the newer companies which are stepping in to, to replace those are uh, producing oil in a cleaner or, or uh, environmentally sustainable way, which is to suggest that, which is to say that the, the legacies of environmental damage are likely to continue as long as oil remains central to the political system of, of these countries. And in fact, Nigeria has exp or has plans to expand its its uh, oil production and gas production in particular, I believe. So uh, I think that this question is extraordinarily important, but I don't have a clear answer for it. It is really important, and I understand not having any answer to it. But I, you know, just from the climate perspective, I'm not sure that it really fits in in the loss and damage area. But it's something that we need to think about. Ex really hard, especially from an equity issue and from the ability to help support local populations, especially in countries where social and economic investment has not been a priority. Um, it's certainly th something that I think the, the global community should be considering more as these companies walk away from investments that are leaving permanent damages behind. You know, for the next question, and and perhaps this is the last or the second to last, I wanted to turn for a moment to um, to fragile countries and how we think about support for weak states. How do we account for the impact of a green transition in how we think about addressing fragility and thinking about supporting fragile countries in developing stronger political systems and uh, more stability? Um. The a, a couple of points here. One is that we we have been um, pursuing, uh, particularly over the last twenty five years, a whole array of sort of state building measures in countries, you know, from South Sudan to to Afghanistan, um, etc. Many of them have been not very successful. And probably the number one reason for for for, um, for their failure is that the, the the places where most effort has been put, it's been in in the shadow of the the war on terror and and, and counterinsurgency. So the the the, the militarization of the uh, the state building agenda has has undermined its its its. Uh, intrinsic values and its and its promise. 
but the um, also it has this agenda has often been pursued uh, without attention to the ways in which um, the national elites are very much focused upon on um, day to day survival, particularly countries that have been through uh, major crises and, and, and meltdowns in which um, state authority has hung on only very tenuously, so that those who are in power, um, there's been a process of of, of selection of those who are successful politicians for those who are skilled at remaining in power rather than those who are um, delivering uh, public goods. And I think the, 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 element of success, if we look at in, in sub-Saharan Africa that we've had, has been one in which the, the norms and principles enshrined by the African Union in its um, formative period of about 20 years ago, when the Africans um, made a, a sort of common commitment to democracy and human rights and peace building, that delivered something. Unfortunately, we're in retreat from that at the moment because of the um, the, the breakdown in the multilateral order, um, the Trump administration um, and the uh, the current um, global rivalries. So there is a huge agenda, a sort of new agenda for peace that I think needs to be reanimated. And I know there are people, including the the UN Secretary General, who are, who, who are thinking along these lines. Can I add something to that? And I think just to say that um, support for green transitions in fragile countries, and again, I'm sort of slightly off the cuff, but uh, support for green transitions in fragile countries may not actually involve direct support to the green transition itself. It may involve support to, uh, to groups which are dealing with the most immediate impacts of that kind of transition or the, or the toxic legacies of that, of, of carbonization and decarbonization. It may involve, uh, for example, supporting civil society to successfully challenge the kinds of politics, the kinds of transactional politics which have already been put in place. And, and, and that might, in fact, be the most successful way, if oblique, of, of supporting uh, green transition. That's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and it's extraordinarily difficult, especially because in these political systems, there's always the, the possibility of unintended negative consequences. But but yeah, there, there's, uh, therein lies the challenge. Thank you so much. And I apologize, but we're going to have to wrap up just as I'm beginning to see a couple more questions coming in. However, I hope that many of you have enjoyed today's discussion and perhaps would be able to follow up individually with the researchers if you have follow up questions. Just last point, one question came in asking about where they can see more of this work being published. And I just wanted to say that a short article was published several months ago on USIP.org. Search for decarbonization and you'll find that short piece. But we are also hoping to publish a paper with Alex and Aditya and other authors in the next few months at USIP. Uh, Alex or Aditya, can you say anything more about where some of this work and is particularly perhaps the case studies are being published? Um, we are going to be putting up um, this, a lot of this material on our own uh, uh, World Peace Foundation website, and we're hoping to, to have an academic publication, which of course will take some months longer. It speaks to how new this work is and how much it's very much a, a field that is in development rather than being very established. But it's one of the reasons that I really appreciate the opportunity to speak about your work today. Many thanks to both of you as speakers. In spite of the fact that I've had the opportunity to, to read some of your work and so on, I still learned from hearing it discussed here. And I appreciate your willingness to take on a couple of questions slightly out of the, the original topic area. 
For all the listeners out there, I hope that you greatly appreciated the discussion with Alex and, Ali- and Aditya, or Aditya today. Apologies, I'm stumbling over words. Um, we are hoping to continue having a series of conversations about the transition to the global green economy. And this is just one kind of early piece in what we hope will become a series. So thank you very much to both our speakers and all the participants today. And we wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you.